Good morning from Baltimore and the National Treasure of the State of Maryland, Morgan State University. Good afternoon along the west coast of Africa and then good Hi. evening in the southern part of Africa. Welcome to yet another session of the transdisciplinary Bogoro Wilson Brangberg series. This event is being shared live, both on cloud, on YouTube, but more importantly, by AD4 Radio and TV. We appreciate you for joining us today. Today, we will have uh, two important presentations. But before I do the introduction, let me tell you about the great things that are happening here at the National Treasure in the state of Maryland, Baltimore. And what are the things happening? First, one of the postdoctoral fellow has successfully invented a machine. In two weeks time, they will tell us more about it with his host. They will tell us about it. Two other postdoctoral fellows are also making a groundbreaking research. And I think this will impress the Research and Development Office of TEDFORM, uh, led by Dr. Giri. But TEDFORM generally, as your sponsor, majority of you here, it should impress them, and we will be sharing that next week. We also have in our midst today one of my colleagues, Dr. Clebon. We will share with you briefly what our office is doing and how each and every one of you can benefit from that opportunities. Dr. Claiborne, you have a few seconds, uh, sorry, a few minutes. You can speak and then uh, thereafter, I will introduce the first speaker today. Yes, thank you, Professor Chajani, for allowing me to speak with you all today. I'm really excited to have and to be here to celebrate and give you information regarding our counseling center here at the Great Morgan State University. Our counseling service is located um, on campus. However, you can gain services virtually. So in the event that you need someone to talk to, about emotions, about time management, about wellness, about transitioning, about transitioning from one place to another. Let me say that. Um, we are here to support you. These services are free and confidential. You can meet with a counselor online in the same platform that you are in right now, a Zoom format, to really talk and to share and to gain coping strategies, or helping with, I, I hope that I, I didn't realize I was muted until I finished. So I don't know if everyone received that information. We did. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. Hey, Carol. Uh, okay, hey, Carol, hey, Kale. <laughs> Say that, Dani. Uh, you can always uh, reach out to Dr. Claiborne. She's doing a great work. Great work. Uh, the counselors are uh, an integral part of our lives, and uh, you should take advantage of the opportunities about you know, whether you are in Nigeria or you are here uh, in the state. Thank you. The first presenter is uh, a young and early uh, scholar, as we say in this part of of uh, of the world, 
Ojo Oyeyemi Afolabi is a lecturer at the Adekunle Ajashi University, Akumba, in uh, Ondo State in Nigeria. But more importantly, is one of the pioneer TED Fund fully sponsored doctoral students in the great department of history, geography, and museum studies. Mr. Ojo is uh, talking to us today about colonial medical system and the role of indigenous agents in Southwestern Nigeria. Mr. Ojo, you have 30 minutes and then you can share your slide and then make your presentation. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us and we hope that we will benefit from your ongoing research. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Prof, for this um, privilege to present my ongoing research on this platform. I count today a very um, good time to present this kind of work, especially as it coincides with um, my, my birthday. Uh, I didn't actually plan. Sorry, for happy birthday. I forgot Thank to you. say that. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. I, I didn't plan for this. Prof also didn't plan for this, but it just happened that this presentation is coming on my birthday. I, my name is Ojo Afolabi. My prof has rightly said, a PhD student uh, in the Department of History, Geography and Museum Studies. Um, I'm one of the Ted Fund doctoral students. In fact, one of the first cohorts that was brought to the United States, fully sponsored. Um, I'm actually interested in the social history of medicine in Africa, specifically, specifically uh, in Nigeria, Southwestern Nigeria. I I'm going to um, share my, my screen. The third pick I'll be addressing this morning, I, I hope we can all see my screen. Um, colonial yes, we can. Yes. medical system and the role of indigenous agents in Southwestern Nigeria, 1889 to 1960. I'd like to say that this is not my first time conducting a research um, in the area of medicine, uh, 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 history of medicine in Nigeria or in Africa, because this issue is also intersects. In 2016, when I was conducting my medical, my, my, my master's degree um, dissertation, uh, 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 feed work at the National Archives in Nigeria, I came across a number of uh, colonial medical records that spurred my interest to look at this, consider this topic. One of the important documents that spurred my interest is the one I'll, I'll also be uh, taking us through quickly this morning, just to also engage you in the discourse this morning. The newspaper article, Lagos Observer, Saturday, 1888. It was popularly known as the Adiola scandal. This scandal was about a woman, an African, that was actually brought in by a policeman into the colonial hospital in 1888, but was eventually abandoned after some weeks. In fact, the colonial surgeon, Dr. Sisidibi, gave a report on the medical information of the woman and said the woman should be discharged on that discharge not improved. Eventually, after some weeks, this woman was neglected. And on Saturday, July 14, this woman eventually died. This spawned a lot of issues within the colony especially the fact that Africans were neglected in the colonial medical administration. 
Eventually, this event marked a turning point on how that the Secretary of State issued that Africans should be involved in the administration of medicine in southwestern Nigeria. This work, this ongoing research is a social history of health and healing system in southwestern Nigeria. My work seeks to examine the role of indigenous Africans in the management of Western medicine in southwestern Nigeria. This work is important because I seek to restore agency to the subordinating groups of indigenous Africans who were very instrumental to the provision of medical services, especially to rural communities in southwestern Nigeria. The work also seeks to understand the ways several African subordinate health workers, such as the dispensary workers, the sanitary workers, sanitary inspectors, native intermediaries, clerks, and local health providers, how they collectively and individually worked to contribute to the promotion of healthcare services in rural spaces in the same region. This work will look at the adaptive ways that the indigenous Africans contributed to the growth and development of medical service in the area. This work will also revisit earlier studies on health and healing in Nigeria and to contribute to ongoing debates on African reactions to colonial medical policies within and outside colonial spaces. Yeah. Beyond even the perspective, I mean, works that have looked at African reactions to colonial medical problems. My work and this work will centrally be based on the argument that Africans do not only react to colonial medical policies, but they acted in their own interest. They adapted, they adapted circumstances to suit themselves and they accommodated and resisted outside pressures in their own diverse ways. Now, I'd like to let us understand that looking at the history of colonial medical system in Southwestern Nigeria is not just um, something that is not relevant to some of the health problems, especially in Africa and even in the area we are talking about this month. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the health of African rural dwellers ranks as one of the most complicated issues, you know, confronted by existing health systems. I just want to emphasize that there are a lot of issues with rural health today, inadequate medical facilities, limited access to health services, unavailability of well-trained medical personnel, this is a problem that continues, such that to today, there are still high rates of infertile and maternal mortality. By addressing this issue, to me, I believe that it will be another way to solving some of the health problems, especially in rural spaces, not only in South Africa, in, in South, Southwestern Nigeria, but also in other uh, areas in Africa. Now, on the history of medicine in Africa, there are existing historical debates. And I want to establish some of these historical debates so that we will see uh, how I will be revisiting discourses, especially in this area and literatures that, are, that have actually uh, treated some of these issues. There are three scholarly persuasions in the history of medicine in Africa. We have the triumphalist narratives. We have the post-colonial historical traditions and the newly emerging revisionist scholarships. The triumphalist narratives, these are the narratives that just merely appreciate or advance European medicine in non-European settings. These 
works are laudatory. They seem to promote Eurocentric ideas, especially in African colonies. The other strand of historical debate are the post-colonial historical traditions. These works are more critical of the Western perspectives on medicine in Africa, especially in the establishment of hospital and medical schools. This second category examine the nexus between medical establishments and the cause of empire. They also explore European encounters in the settings such as in India, South Asia, and Africa. In fact, one of the works in this area, the popular work of Philip Cotton, The White Man's Grave and Disease and Empire. These are studies that have looked at empire or colonies, West African colonies, as a white man's grave, merely describing the European activities to bring solution to tropical problems in some of these colonies. The last trend, which is actually the revisionist school, they revisit all other earlier perspectives to show that the, argue, the, 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 the critiques of post-colonial nar uh, narratives, especially by looking at the mentioning and empire debates, should go beyond the binary categories of the colonizers and the colonized. This revisionist scholar, instead, they further that there are multiple engagements of scientific ideas within and without individual colonies. My work intends to revisit the history of medicine within the revisionist perspective by looking at the contributions of Africans and their reactions to medical development in Southwestern Nigeria. Also to look at how Africans received Western medicine how they imagined, reimagined, how they promoted, they acted, how, how, how they acted in other roles, even beyond the, 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 the description or the establishment of colonial medicine. Now, uh, for the sake of those who might not be familiar with Southwestern Nigeria this morning, this work will look at Southwestern Nigeria in the present day Nigeria. The area lies between uh, the Yoruba speaking people of Oshun, Oyo, Ogun, Lagos, Undo, and Ekiti State. Um, I, I, I will not give all other information this morning because of my time. Um, concerning the methodology, that this research we adopt is going to be research intensive using primary and secondary sources. The study will also rely on archival records from the National Archives in Ibadan and oral sources. Relevant ar archival collections in Ibadan consist of the colonial med annual medical reports, colonial annual administrative reports, reports of medical and sanitary services, official correspondences between and colonial governments, between colonial government and the colonial office in the United Kingdom, reports of the colonial secretary, as well as intelligence reports that relate to the theme of this research, dating from the 1860 to 1960. I just want to quickly point us to the fact that um, 1889 is important in this research because it was the year that the Lagos ordinance was established after the Adiola scandal that I described um, happened. That was the beginning of the involvement of Africans in the colonial medical administration. I'm also going to look at the African responses to medical policies, which are garnered from newspaper publications. Then I will look at, uh, I'll corroborate uh, these uh, archival records with oral evidence. I still believe that there are remaining elders who worked as care practitioners, social sanitary inspectors, 
dispensary workers and other subordinate workers that will be able to provide information. Even those that are not able to provide information, they can provide the contact person that I will refer to for this research. I'm gonna be using a theoretical framework for this work, which was referred to as the biographical pedagogical discourse. I want to acknowledge here uh, the kind of uh, scholarly advice provided by Professor Tijani for this, which I found to be very relevant to some of the things I want to consider under this research. The concept of biographical pedagogical discourse, which was propounded in 2010, 2010 um, looked at how that the history of men, or it presupposes that the history of men and women is not only ideal, but must be explained within the local and the global space. Biographical discourse will be used for this work as a yardstick for measuring the totality of the subject okay. of the study. The historicize the roles of indigenous Americans. Again, one of the things that also interests me in this work is to look at the issue of medical pluralism. <laughs> I want to emphasize the fact that Africans <laughs> indigenous medical practices, as the use of health forms of medical therapeutics. This was because, despite the fact that the colonial medical service provided some form of health care services, yet it did not actually uh, meet all the needs in most rural spaces in southwestern Nigeria. Therefore, what Africans were merely doing at that time was to combine the Western medicine with indigenous medicine. So basically, uh, my work, we look at how Africans were initially not involved in the colonial medical system. But as event turned on, like the last scandal from 1889, involved, began to involve Africans. I argue in this work, I'm going to argue in this work that against other earlier studies that have merely said that Africans were reacting to colonial medical policies or were involved in the colonial medical administration. That I believe that, yes, Africans were reacting, but they were reacting because primarily they were sidelined initially. And when they were even involved, they were not involved in the key roles in the colonial medical service. So Africans that were involved eventually, like the dispensary workers, the subordinating staff of the colonial medical system, began to act even beyond the confines of the colonial medical system. Like the sanitary attendants, for example, they collected water samples, the noted mosquito breeding sites, felling of trees. These were also other rules that some of them even performed, even by negotiating with the colonial uh, administration for the promotion of healthcare service delivery in the most rural communities in southwestern Nigeria. I believe that we understand that this work, like I've said, is an ongoing research, and I will really appreciate our suggestions, our contributions to this work. But just before um, I, I close for the presentation, I want to appreciate, again, um, esteemed director of the Office of the Global, Global Partnership for Granting me this opportunity to present my ongoing research. 
colleagues who have joined this meeting. Uh, Dr. Lundin from Nigeria. I want to appreciate also uh, quickly my uh, advisor, uh, Dr. Jeremiah Dubois. Uh, I, I, I don't know if he has joined yet. My other uh, friends from South Africa, those from also the Lagos Studies Association and all other persons that are right here. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ojo, for the brilliant presentation. Uh, may I please, may I please appeal to us to kindly mute when we join uh, any webinar. It is just decent, you know, because you, you have created a big bottleneck editing before we share this recording globally. So please mute your audio. Adama, Adamu Rada, Dagoma, please mute. You mute when you sign in, please, please. Uh, we will hold on to our questions as in the practice until the second presentation is uh, given. Our comment, we hold on to it for Mr. Hojo. It is deliberate to do that because we do not want a presenter to just Andrew check out after presenting. You have to listen and gain knowledge from the second presentation. At this point, I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Adetokumbo Otumu McGregor, uh, who presented a brilliant paper two weeks ago, and whose paper is the only one in my career that is just three decades and some four years that I witnessed a three in one. And he eloquently presented, we learn. And up to today, I still get emails of people trying to network and collaborate with him. Dr. Tumo will present to us the second presenter. He has a choice of giving us skills that is busy. Of course, he is busy like all of us, but he's multitasking. And that is what we are modeling to all of you. Dr. Tumo, you have the virtual space to present the next speaker, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prof. Good morning, all. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, run a quick um, biography about the next presenter. Um, he's a person of engineer, Dr. R. Kono Kuga. He's a third founder um, postdoc with the Department of Civil Engineering in the Morgan State University, Baltimore, USA. Engineer Dr. Eze Onuguga is a chief lecturer with the Department of Civil Engineering, Federal Polytechnic, Nekede, Imo State, Nigeria. He has a PhD in Civil Stroke Water Resources Engineering. He also has an advanced diploma in Water Resources and Urban Management in Galilee, Israel. He also has an F engine in Civil Stroke Water Resources Engineering, and finally, B engine from um, UNN with the upper class division. Engineer Dr. Eze Onokoga is a member of several professional bodies. He's a registered, um, is registered with Koren, member of Nigerian Society of Engineers, member of American Society of Civil Engineers, and is also a fellow Institute of Development Administration of Nigeria. He has held several positions in his school, Federal, Federal Polytechnic Nikkei. He was one time the Dean School of Engineering Technology. He was also one time the Acting Director of Works, one time Coordinating Director of the Polytechnic under the Fabrication Center, also one time the Head of Department of Civil Engineering. 
He has also done a state service as a member of Imo State Science and Technology Roadmap 2020 to 2030 committee. He has also done several consultancy work with the Shaw Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria Limited under the Community Development Infrastructure Support Service for Greater Otakot Area, Community Development Infrastructure Service for Afa Node, um, contributor to Shell People of Development, and also member River State Blueprint Team. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to quickly say, um, engineer Dr. Eze Onokuga has over 50 publications to his credit. And um, he has also gotten several awards and honors to his credit. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you um, engineer Dr. Eze Onokuga, Ted Fund MSU Postdoc Research Fellow. Dr. Eze, you have the floor, please. Okay. Dr. Eze, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Tu, for that warm introduction. Yeah. I'm actually attending a, the World Water Tech Innovation Summit in London. So good day. And uh, I had to steal out this time to make this presentation. It's part of, uh, it's an ongoing work, but it's gone at an advanced stage with some findings. But let me quickly share my screen and get on to the business of the day. Please go ahead. You are a co-host. You can do that. Okay. As he is preparing, I'm thinking about the relationship between that window, okay. engineering of water and the medical history. At the comment and question time, we will shed more light into that. So thank you and welcome to this segment. This is on the effects of aspect ratio on COD removal efficiency for cyanide inhibited wastewater in aerobic systems. My name is Dr. Eza Onukua, as previously introduced by Dr. Tu. So we'll run along. For brevity, I've decided to break down this presentation in an outline that, that flows thus. Introduction, will be methodology, will be some of the results which I have achieved now, and then some conclusions and recommendations. Introduction. Wastewater treatment in developing countries is a problem to manage. And this is especially so because not so much is known about most of the constituent elements of most wastes. In general terms, treatment of water from both domestic and industrial sources are a major concern for engineers in cities and urban areas of Nigeria. Therefore, as the mode of living of the populace improves, the need to review the effects of various physical chemical and biological characteristics of wastewater will also increase so as to evolve improved methods of treatment. Now, when we talk of cyanide inhibition in wastewater, the greatest uh, contributor to that in our locality is cassava, or, or otherwise called manihot esculenta crans, and which is one of the leading food and feed plants in the world. Nigeria currently is the largest producer of cassava in the whole world, with an annual output of over 34 million tons of that tuberous root. And this plays a dominant role in the rural economy of the country's southern agroecological zone. Over the years, cassava has been transformed into a number of products both for domestic use, depending on local customs, and then preference, and also for industrial uses. Cassava in the fresh form contains cyanide, which is extremely toxic. 
and cassava is usually traded in its processed forms because you have to reduce it to a manageable form so that you can move it from one place to the other in the various forms that is required. So processing that tuber into dry form normally involves moisture reduction so as to convert it to a more durable and stable product with less volume, which makes it more transportable. Cassava wastewater is therefore an industrial filtrate obtained during the processing of cassava into the various forms. The wastewater, sir. The wastewater from cassava processing is derivatives. Ends up with domestic sewage if processed in small quantities, such as in small households and smaller places, while others end up being carried with industrial waste if processed in large industrial quantities. Now, pertaining to the treatment, a great number of recent studies have reported many approaches to improve and even model the quality of cassava waste for that treatment and the effects of different processing modalities of the tuberous roots on the level of these toxic substances and functional properties has been assessed. A mathematical regression model for treatment efficiency, ROE, was created in 2015 using anaerobic baffled reactors. The model is given as follows that treatment efficiency is equal to 0 0.8303-8504 times length to width, that's the aspect ratio, raised to the power 0 0.019319 times number of baffles, raised to the power 0 0.0011, divided by the inhibition constant, raised to the power 0 0.012 times the flow rate, raised to the power 0 0.016 where RU is COD removal efficiency. L over W is the length to width ratio or aspect ratio. NB is the number of baffles. KI is the inhibitor coefficient and Q is the influent flow rate. This is not moving. <laughs> Statement of problem. Because biological wastewater treatment system focuses on the exploitation of microorganisms to break down organic wastes, the presence of cyanide portends some form of inhibition to the healthy operation of such systems. And efforts are thus continuously channeled towards the involvement of the most profitable methods of treating wastewater discharges. And by this treatment is meant the production of highly treated effluents at minimal operating costs. The aerobic systems have been known to offer greater treatment efficiencies, including odor reduction. In fact, one of the fallouts of the uh, anaerobic system is that it produces methane gas, which if not properly managed can cause serious explosions. And then it produces odor. We don't need those, especially for those who are operating within a municipal areas. Now the objectives are as follows. To define the biokinetic coefficients, the yield coefficient, the endogenous decay, KD, the half saturation constant, and K. These constants are necessary to apply the mathematical models for completely mixed aerobic systems. And these coefficients are critical for system design. The second part is to study the operational behavior of some physical chemical parameters associated with the treatment. And thirdly, to create a polynomial relationship for predicting COD removal efficiency as a function of aspect ratio, flow rate, and the inhibitor concentration. Methodology. For this study, bench scale models were employed and uh, we got seven in number. So each of the seven will, will present one case. And this operation of seven bench scale models of activated sludge reactors with varying aspect ratio. So their dimensions and their outlooks are not the same, but their volume is the same eight liters. 
So these reactors were operated for treatment of the selected wastewater at various values of hydraulic retention times. Air was supplied to the system by means of an adjustable air pump. That pump served to supply oxygen to the system, and that is the, that is the activation, as well as provide for complete mixing, because when the rate is maintained at the value used for the experiment, the contents of the reactor will be in a completely mixed uh, state. And the wastewater flow rate was controlled by means of a peristaltic pump. That the, 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 the figure will come after this. Now, two sets of two major sets of experiments were run. The first set were for the purpose of determining the kinetic coefficients of the wastewater. While uh, and for that, the, the influent wastewater, the reactor, and the effluent were analyzed for various physical and chemical parameters in accordance with standard methods. This is a nomenclature of the terms that will appear in most of this work. SRUT means solid retention time. S0 means the influent COD concentration. S means the effluent COD concentration. X0 means the influence suspended solids concentration. I is the inhibitor concentration. Q is the flow rate. KD is the endogenous decay coefficient. Y is the cell yield. K is the maximum rate of substrate utilization. And KS is the half velocity constant. Now, this is the this is, experiment, this is the schematic of the experimental setup. So you have a calibrated feed tank. This is where the raw wastewater is brought in. And by means of this peristaltic pump, it feeds this system. This system has had the, the, the raw wastewater in here for like 28 days, and then was deemed to have attained a steady, steady state. So the bacteria and the, the buildup was therefore dimmed enough to cause some treatment to happen before the experiment started. So this, this burn scale reactor, this is typical of one. This is the plan. And it's divided into two parts. This is the ration part. And this is the clarifier. And this is where the effluent will come out through into a calibrated effluent collection tank. Now, these first order relationships for completely mixed reactors were employed in the studies. That's equation one, equation two, three, and four. Equation two and three were employed to determine the biokinetic coefficient. While equation four was employed to determine the treatment efficiency. Applying the experimental results to equation two and three, graphs were plotted to determine the biokinetic coefficients, Y, KD, K, and KS for the seven cases of aspect ratio. Graphs of Q, which is the flow rate, into S naught minus S over VW times X naught against one over SRUT were plotted. And the intercepts and slopes of the graphs were read for the seven cases. KD, and why for each of the cases were determined from the intercepts and slopes using the relationship that KD is equal to intercept over slope and Y is one over slope. These values, the values for the computation are given in table three, which is coming here under. From table four, similarly, graphs of SRUT over one plus KD times SRUT against Y over S were plotted as shown in figure three for the seven cases from which the K will be equal to one over the intercept and KS will be the intercept over slope. This method was illustrated. 10,000 party in Nigeria. Then results and discussion. This is the, this is the matrix of the reactor dimensions. So on this first left column, you will see the length, width, height. Of course, the volume remains constant at eight liters. 
Then for reactor one, you can see the length, width, and height, and that is case one. Case two has its associated length, width, and height, and so on till, till case seven. This is the results of the experimental runs for determination of KD and Y. So the measured variables are S, S not, X not, and S are rooted. So where the, where the variables are as earlier defined. So we had a first run, a second run, a third run, and a fourth run. This gave us the four points on which to approximate the trend, which will lead us to a determination of the intercept and slope. From here, we'll, we'll get a, a computational sheet where we took the plotting position. So that's the continuation of the observed uh, data. And now, these calculations were made to determine the plotting positions. And from there, we could read the intercept and slope from which we could compute KD and Y. That was done for the seven cases. This is typical of what that plotting will be. So this is like for case one. That's the graph. That we now try to get the straight line out of it by, by the Excel tool, and with which we could get the equation of that line. So we could get the slope and the intercept. And with that, we transform them to get the values of Y and KD. The computational sheet for, for determination of K and KS. So a similar procedure was done. And then we could compute the intercept and slope for the individual cases, as we can get from this graph. We'll only linearize it, and you will see that it's a, arrow square value is quite high, showing a good uh, correlation. So that's the equation. From here, you can see that the slope is 67.8, 68.8, and the intercept is 0 0.502. Now you can transform that to determine K and KS. Now, the second part is the COD removal efficiency. So for each of the cases, we had the initial substrate concentration, which is the, the influent COD, and that's the effluent COD. So, and when you apply that relationship we stated in equation four, we'll get the various values of efficiency running from 81% to 83%. And it's good to observe now that this efficiency is increasing as the aspect ratio is decreasing because the aspect ratio for case one is the highest, while other seven is the lowest. Incidentally, that is giving us the greater efficiency. Now, the making of the model, we are now trying to relate the aspect ratio, the cyanide concentration, which is the inhibitor concentration, and then the flow rate against the treatment efficiency, the COD removal efficiency. So based on the data gathered in the work and the analysis conducted, the correlation was developed using multivariate analysis tool. The developed correlation gives a clear measure of the contribution of each of the three factors, aspect ratio, inhibitor concentration, and discharge on the COD removal efficiency and can be used to make a quick prediction of the possible effects of giving levels of these three factors on the removal efficiency. The square of the regression coefficient of the correlation, R squared, was obtained as 0 0.9990, 9990, which is a good indication of a strong relationship between the independent and the dependent variables. The summary of the correlation parameters is shown in table eight. Model parameters definition. So I think we are, we are used to this. And then 
these are the values of the effluent, the microorganisms, the, 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 the mixed liquid suspended solids, and the effluent. Uh, so this is the summary of the correlation parameters. That's from the Excel worksheet. And these are the coefficients. So based on those, the polynomial model was evolved. As a linear function, it could only be linearized by taking logarithms. And this is what the result is. Or otherwise, it can be written in this form that the, that the uh, uh, removal efficiency is equal to Q, which is the flow rate, raised to the power 0 0.07451, divided by the E inhibitor concentration, raised to the power 0 0.1711, times the aspect ratio, raised to the power 0 0.06116, where, of course, ROE, ROE is the COD removal efficiency. L over W is the length width or aspect ratio. I is the inhibitor, in this case, is cyanide, the cyanide concentration, and Q is the flow rate. Then the third portion, which is to, to, to monitor some of the physical chemical uh, properties of uh, this, these runs. So this is the relationship between the acidity for the influent and the effluent. So there was a general increase in the acidity value from uh, a lower peak of 0 0.001 up to a high peak of uh, 0 0.0035. That's for the acidity. This is the influent and the effluent turbidity during the reactor operation. Well, this is a very good uh, indicator of uh, the effectiveness of the treatment, uh, you can see that the turbidity reduced drastically from an influent peak of 100, about 180 MTU, that's the nephelometric turbidity units, to a lower peak of 26.3 uh, in the effluent. This is a very good indicator that uh, that treatment was uh, effective. Similarly for alkalinity, there was a drop, a very serious drop in the alkalinity level between the influent and the effluent. And this is also the, the, the variation of pH throughout the regime of the runs. There was also a drop, a general drop in the pH even though the values remained in the same range. So within, within, within the same range, you know, the neutral pH is seven. So they were all operating within that. Uh... All right, in conclusion, there is clearly a negative correlation between the COD removal efficiency and the aspect ratio for cassava wastewater treatment in aerobic systems as revealed by this study. And this, removal efficiency also exhibited a negative correlation with the inhibitor concentration. In other words, what it means is that <laughs> being an inhibitor, any increase in its value is going to affect the treatment efficiency. But these results are in disagreement for the anaerobic systems as reported by previous uh, studies. So it looks like the anaerobic system is presenting something opposite from, from literature. And then the square of the regression coefficient for this correlation, R squared of 0 0.99990, is a good indication of a strong relationship between the independent and dependent variables. Recommendation. Further study is required to define an optimal value for the aspect ratio. Because as you can see, we started, we had some limited values, but uh, there's need to continue the study or do an optimization, which will reveal what should be about the best range for the aspect ratio. Now, pilot scale studies are also required to corroborate these findings. By this, I mean that one can pick up one of the 
places with uh, a good industrial discharge of the wastewater and they install a pilot plant there, which will be bigger in scale to what uh, we have used in this study. What we have used are miniature scales, uh, somewhat miniature scales. Uh, they don't represent uh, a very full-time operations. When we try this with pilot scale studies, we may now see what, whether we can corroborate uh, the same results. And because the aerobic systems require energy, which is why most people or most uh, organizations run away from them, that pump that pumps both the air and the one that pumps the, the wastewater itself, they, are, they, they require energy to work. So consideration of solar energy option for such systems, now that solar energy concept is widespread, will add value to the energy costs in operation over time. Now, uh, these are the references. And I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I must much acknowledge, you. before I end this uh, presentation, let me acknowledge Dr. James Hunter Jr. of the Department of Civil Engineering, an associate professor and uh, coordinator of postgraduate studies, and my host. So he's been part of assistance. Dr. Bweke B. Oguti Main, an associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, he also provided me with some literature. And I can never forget Professor Hakim Tijani for all his support. And also Dr. Robert Netty. Uh, more blessings to you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful, informative and educational presentation. I would like to commend the two presenters for this important presentation and for sharing their research with us. Uh, if you would like to make a comment, kindly use the uh, virtual hand up. Uh, if you are a a host to the uh, postdoctoral fellow, if Dr. Anta is here, or Dr. Gunti Meng, or Dr. Owolabi, uh, you can uh, please indicate. If Dr. Jerry Dibwa is here, the chair of history department, kindly uh, indicate, although I will be going up you know, looking at uh, the screen, I can only see 25 mm. on my laptop and I have to screen. Uh, we've been between 79 to 85 this, this session. Again, thank you. Let me start by saying this. Um, Dr. Eze, you have actually validated our ongoing uh, prospect of a collaboration that is between Morgan State University, represented by you know uh, some of your hosts, myself, uh, the Office of Global Partnerships, and the Lagos State Water Commission. Uh, the Executive Secretary or our representative should be here if they are not here born, uh, returning from Zambia to Nigeria today. Uh, what am I saying? Uh, your, your presentation really, really validates some of the things we've been brainstorming about in the last uh, few months. And uh, definitely you will be uh, engaged, incorporated as uh, one of the people to further investigate and assist legal state government in, in uh, this uh, process. Uh, having said that, let me ask you the following. Maybe you can shed more light to us. I see strongly that relationship between STEM and the non-STEM. As Professor Dibua, Jeremiah Dibua, you know, admonished all of us two weeks ago. And if you had listened since we started, you look at Mr. Ojo's presentation on colonial medical services. 
the sanitary inspectors, particularly the picture that is shared with us about the sanitary inspector looking at the water and how, whether or not it, it is consumable. And then you link it all with this water waste that I am thinking is not really a waste. So my first question to Dr. Eze is, can you share with us your research or the prospect of being able to tell us globally that the waste is not really a waste, but a benefit. Just like the COVID has come to change our world. Our everyday life, as the sociologists and the anthropologists will say, has really changed because of COVID. Do you think removal of water from Kazava is a waste or are there studies or what that could be beneficial to the society and indeed the global community uh, for, the, for the use or the turnaround of waste, as you, you put it? Uh, also, what are the prospects of water for all? being affordable, water for all, not just the sachet water. Since your location is Nigeria, and I believe your research also will primarily focus on the local, you, you will agree with me that uh, the sachet water is becoming beyond the uh, affordability level of the common man and woman. So what do you think you can you know, uh, advise both commercial and government in making water accessible and affordable to the rural community and what have you? Uh, to Mr. Ujo, uh, I'm looking at, listening to you, I'm, I'm seeing a kind of uh, the past the present and the future, so important in our discourse, uh, either in the classroom or outside the classroom, in terms of policy making and benefit to, to the citizens. And what am I saying? Can you share with us the benefit of pre-colonial or colonial period protocol in decent living, in decent living as it relates to well being and health matters. Okay, thank you very much. I have not seen any uh, virtual hand up, but I think the presenters can quickly respond, or you can go in any order, it does not really matter. Uh, okay, I have uh, two hands up, sorry. Uh, I think this is Dr. Inegu. Is that Dr. Chika? You can unmute. Is that Dr. Chika? No, it's not Dr. Chika. Inegu. Okay, you can go ahead, please. Followed by uh, Dr. Samuel. Uh, I want to thank the presenters, uh, uh, especially Dr. Onukua, who uh, was the one presenting when I joined. <laughs> I want to thank you very much. It's not bad to maybe from Environmental Management Department of Futu. Yes. Uh, I, I enjoy your presentation, even though there are a lot of uh, calculations there and the design. But uh, uh, something I want to ask, since we are talking about waste to wealth, I want to know in the design, is there any way of uh, making sure that cyanide is uh, recovered and stored for you since it can also be useful, especially in production of paper, textile, and uh, the like, uh, plastics too. So I want to... Thank you very much. You can mute yourself. Thank you very much. Please mute, kindly mute, please, please. Uh, the next person that was, uh, the hand was up, Kindly go ahead and make your intervention. You can bring down your hand and I will. 
Okay, thank you, sir. Dr. Ogundipa. All right, sir. Good afternoon. I want to thank the two presenters for the for sharing their knowledge with us. I have um, one question each for the presenters. The first presenter was looking at uh, colonial um, historical value of colonial treatment, I mean, medical treatment, and considering Southwest in particular. And maybe I did not listen very well, but I don't think he mentioned the reason he's making that study. The reason he's making that study. Um, is it that the orthodox medical style and the local medical style, uh, when we look at them together, is, good, is helping us. Therefore, we should embark on both or we should drop one for the other. I want him to just explain further on that one. Then wow. the second, yes, sir. Second presenter, oh, can I go on, sir? Please, sir, go ahead. The second presenter um, made a talk on water waste, how uh, to manage the water waste. And uh, I started the, I tried to look at the graphs that he presented. Um, in the, one of the graphs, he, he was telling us that he wanted to make the graph straight. We wanted to make the graph straight. And um, I want to ask, why? Why do one with the graph straight? I want to pursue, I want to think that it is so that to correct some anomalies in what is studying. But the second question now will be that when you remove all these um, things that we don't want in the water system, are we saying that the water will not have any side effect again? Maybe we should look at that one too. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Oyinloye, I could see you nodding. Do you, would you like to make further intervention? Just unmute yourself, sir. Dr. Oyinloye, you can mute. Uh, let's allow the presenters to respond. Prof, uh, please let me, let me uh, beg you so I can take this and go for the closing. Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, so let me start from you. Uh, you are asking about what's the prospect of water for all. Mm -hmm like for our, our locale, which is Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You see the bane, the bane, what we, are, what, what we are talking apparently, is when we talk of wastewater, wastewater, okay, now can imagine the sewage that comes from your house, from your toilet facilities, that's what you call the, the gray and black water. If you allow that to flow into the rivers, uh, you are not likely to be improving the water supply to those in the rural areas who drink directly from the, from the river. Am I right? That being the case, that is why the, the NESREA and the uh, Environmental Protection Agency make rules as to what should leave your house or your factory into the environment. So what we are talking about is to make that as harmless as it can be before discharge. For you to have water for all, you must also protect your sources of water. When you allow these untreated waste waters, waste water is any water that you have finished with in the house and you don't have uh, a recycling uh, potential. In certain civilized places where they have central uh, treatment plants, central sewage, you have oxidation ponds, you have all sorts of uh, treatment, they can carry this thing to the level of tertiary treatment. For example, while I was in Israel, there is a place they call Igudan. All the storm water, all the sewage and everything is channeled to Igudan. And from there is treated and re returned back to its original quality through red pipes. Now they use them for irrigation, but they are good enough for drinking. And then the sludge and all that, I used to uh, uh, refertilize the agricultural lands. So it's not like we are talking of waste, wasting water or so. We are talking about treatment. You see the septic tank in, your, in, in, uh, in our buildings, which you don't find in civilized places like we are now. You don't even know where the thing goes. But back home in Nigeria, you find that each home, each household, they are a septic tank. And that is, that is the biological reactor we are talking about. For you to now have perfected the building of uh, so septic tanks, it's been an old practice. 
some of those equations and coefficients which we derive, they're also existing for domestic sewage and all that. And they are the ones, the things necessary to adequately size their design capacities. So we are not like talking about wasting water. And then we can actually have water for all, but we need to pay the price. One, you need to protect the sources of water. You see, our major sources are the surface waters and the ground waters. So however you discharge this, they will find their ways either to the surface water or to the ground water. So, so that, will, that will also uh, necessitate treatment at the water works and all that. They, increase, they tend to increase the cost of water treatment before they can be reticulated back to your home. So it's achievable, but then there's a lot of human uh, control and factor which we must uh, have to embark on. And then somebody said, why remove water from waste? That's why I said, we're not just removing water from waste. We're saying already want to process uh, cassava, for example. You want to make flour. Remember that during the, during the tenure of uh, President Olusego of Asanjo, he tried to clamp down on uh, 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 the bakers and say they must use cassava flour. They must start using cassava flour. So these are these are these are these are ideas that will proliferate the use of cassava. So industries will spring up. And for you to do this, you must have to dewater this thing. It must generate wastewater. Either you're washing or you're peeling or these things, these processes will generate wastewater. So where do they go to? What the government is saying before they leave your industrial premises and pollute other places, make sure you treat them. So this is what is necessitating these studies so that we know how to handle them. Because the normal uh, relationships for treatment of the sewage do not really apply. Because in a biological reactor, why is a reactor is that the bacteria will, they will consume whatever is in the system and grow. When they grow and if the system is designed well, they will finish whatever nutrient is there and then they start feeding on themselves and the endogenous phase and then they'll kill themselves and go off. And what you now have is biomass. So this is why you require to treat, uh, to design systems that can bring this reaction to a quick close. So that what you discharge will be a bit harmless. So that's that. And then uh, uh, somebody said waste to wealth. I talked about recovery of cyanide. Sorry, that is not the scope of, it's not in the scope of this work. That's not what I was looking at when I set out to do this. It can still be done. Uh, I'm sure some, uh, some uh, serious chemistry can produce that. Uh, and like I said earlier, if you use the anaerobic system, you can still generate methane gas because one of the processes for that is what they call methanogenesis and it liberates methane. In my previous study, I had nearly had a blowout until I now put some scrubbers to take the methane gas away into some, some uh, uh, water and put them there to escape. It would, have been, it would have been that dangerous. Then the other question that says, why make the graph straight? The relationship we have seen in equation two and three are linear relationships. You see, we know that the behavior is linear. When you are doing experiment, because of one thing or the other, you may not have created the perfect uh, condition. And for any linear relationship, you need, the, you, need the, you need the slope, which is the gradient, and the intercept. Those things are very necessary for us to determine the coefficients. That's what those graphs are there to do. They are linear in nature. The relationship between them is a linear one. And if you see the high uh, uh, arrow squared, for them, when you see that uh, coefficient of determination or coefficient of that, to be of that 90%, 80-90%, you will see that the relationship, the assumed linear relationship is, uh, is factual. Let me stop there so that I can join my colleagues to close uh, my syndicate group in this other conference. But thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Eze. Uh, Dr. Adura Agbenro, I believe your question is, is not. Or is it for Dr. Eze? If it is, quickly unmute. Yes, thank you very much, sir. And I thank the presenters and well done, sir. Um, sir, 
the your comments, in fact, made me to want to comment about is the your, need is for your water. question. Sorry, ma. Is your question for Dr. Eze? He has to get into another meeting. Now. Is the present the presenter uh, the water in terms okay, of yeah, water, that's Dr. Eze. Quickly make it. Yes, sir. That um, it's not only the rural areas that actually need water, even the urban areas. You, I mean, though most urban areas we find they may be sinking um, wells or digging boreholes. And many times, even the water they can't drink, they keep buying bottled water. So it's just to talk about the need for water for not only rural areas, then but we're mindful of rural areas, also the urban areas. And what are the implications of all the boreholes, every, almost every house having digging, sinking boreholes in recent times? Thank you very much, Sas. Thank you. Dr. Eze, thank you so much yeah. for the response. And I think uh, we've learned Thank you once again, uh, Prof, for the comment and the question. Quickly, I will respond to the question on the benefits of the colonial period. The, the protocol as it relates to the well-being and, uh, and health matters. I, I, I like to say that um, one of the questions that has often been asked is that how can Africa contribute to global development? And one of the things I I have always said is, is this, if you, if you look at um, the medical system, especially in Nigeria, or in most African countries, they have not actually uh, continued to promote indigenous knowledge systems. One of the things that my work seeks to do is to bring to bear the fact that during the colonial period, for example, in Nigeria, um, Africans who were part of the colonial medical service or even the rural people were not just docile, were not just um, uh, uh, accepting, they did not just accepted the Western medicine. They also were using their indigenous medical knowledge systems. The use of herbs, the use of concussions. In fact, there is one reading in the archives that I used. There was one uh, colonial uh, official, Bosman, who actually patronized indigenous uh, medicine, concussion, when he, he contacted malaria, when, 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 when he had malaria. And there are other readings like that in the colonial archives. But the challenge is, if you look at the historiography of medicine in, in Africa, even in Nigeria, they have merely just talked about the achievements of colonial medicine in these spaces without looking at the impact of the indigenous knowledge system. And that's why if you look at uh, my study, I, I intend to look at the issue of medical pluralism. By medical pluralism, I mean that there was a synergy in the use of Western medicine and indigenous medicine. Now to the second question, the, the, the other person asked the reason for this study. Uh, he asked whether we should use both Western and indigenous knowledge system. In fact, um, one of the reasons why my work we focus on um, the rural spaces in Southwestern Nigeria is because we will see that most rural spaces in Southwestern Nigeria, even up to today, they are neglected in the administration of medicine. And that's why in most rural spaces, people continue to patronize indigenous, indigenous medicine. So it was also during the colonial period. This research will bring to bear what happened during the colonial period so that we can see that even the problems that we have today, they are, they are also reflective of the colonial legacies. For example, sidelining indigenous knowledge system, promoting, why promoting Western knowledge system. Meanwhile, this, this, some of these things were popular, especially in the urban areas, but yet the rural people, the indigenous people kept on using their indigenous medicine. And I, one of the things that I intend to summarize in my work is to show that 
there should be a synergy between Western medicine and indigenous medicine. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very much. I guess without missing out anyone, is that all the question? Dr. Netty, do you have um, anything to add to particularly this colonial medical uh, issues and uh, facilities? Uh, I think um, what I would say to uh, th this field needs to be studied further, just for the fact of uh, contraindications, because we don't know, you know, what um, uh, medicines may be contraindicated using uh, colonial, uh, you know, uh, remedies. Um, so all that I can say is that I, it, it needs to be studied further. Uh, when I was leaving the country of Ghana, that's uh, my home uh, country. Uh, I think they, uh, they had started licensing um, medical, um, uh, the medical facilities at Tema uh, to uh, further study these kinds of areas. I'm not particularly sure where they've gotten to with it, but um, it, it needs to be looked into. Otherwise, uh, you know, you, you might give uh, some medicine from the uh, Western uh, Hemisphere um, that seemingly would not work, but is it because it's been, um, you know, we're using some local um, remedies also that uh, contract uh, indicates it, its effects. Uh, thank you very much. And I think at this point, we are going to wrap it up for, for today. Uh, we're closing with 92 and I'm guessing 95 because I could see some of us multitasking in one, <laughs> one window. Uh, we thank you most sincerely. We thank uh, AD4 Radio TV in Abuja. Uh, we'd like to thank all our colleagues, particularly um, I could see the Dean of Faculty of Arts, Professor Tobalashe, always with us. Uh, I'm still checking whether Professor Emeritus Sogolo is still with us. He joined us as early as uh, uh, 9.30. If you are with us, sir, uh, can you just share a word of knowledge? I can't, I can't see him anymore in the participant uh, list. Again, thank you very much. We look forward to another uh, meeting in two weeks time. Uh, that will be on the night. I will communicate if we will be, uh, we, should, we should meet, we should meet, even if I'm, I'm in the here or at the airport. Again, this is part of our responsibility to have plan A, B, C, be resilient and multitask. No, no, I repeat, no excuses whatsoever in this business of sharing knowledge and being responsible for learning to occur. Thank you and stay blessed. Bye-bye.